this is Kim Ironman, founder at Eco Beneficial, bringing you more useful gardening tips to help improve our environment. Today, I've got the pleasure of interviewing Annie White. Annie is a PhD student at the University of Vermont, and she's in the Department of Plant and Soil Science. Now, Annie's been doing some really fascinating uh, research and uh, couldn't wait to interview her. If uh, you'd like more information about what she's doing, please do visit her website, which is www.pollinatorgardens.org. Now, Annie's research is on the attractiveness of flowering perennials to pollinators basically looking at what she calls true native open pollinated straight species plants versus cultivars. She's got some interesting information to share. Um, as I understand it, Annie, your uh, planting was done in 2012 with the first research collected in uh, 2013, correct? Yes, that's All correct. Right, great. Well, thank you and welcome. I really appreciate having you here. So, thank would you. you would you tell us a little bit about how you um, decided to do this particular research? Yes, well, I'm coming from um, a background in landscape design. I worked as a landscape designer for about six years after doing my master's work in landscape architecture. And during this time, I worked on um, a large number of projects in the Midwest area uh, that had a real ecological focus, and I was working a great deal with native plants. And one thing that I really struggled with as a, as a designer who would come up with planting plans for um, gardens with a specific focus like a butterfly garden or a pollinator garden um, that were intentionally using native plants for their ecological benefits. And one thing that I always struggled with is I would provide a plant list to contractors of native plants and then I would find that the majority of the time they were planting cultivars of these. They weren't planting the, the true species. Um, and so I just, uh, that sort of raised a red flag in, in my mind as to whether these cultivars were really providing the same ecological benefit as as the true species. And um, I realized that no one had researched this topic and I felt like it was really important. And so I took the challenge on and I went back to school um, at the University of Vermont working with Dr. Leonard Perry and have uh, taken on the challenge of trying to answer the question myself. Now, for those uh, gardeners who might be listening who are new gardeners, could you uh, define cultivar for us? Sure. A cultivar is a, it's a variation of a species. So something that's been deliberately selected or bred by humans for some kind of a desirable trait. Um, oftentimes that desirable trait might be a, a certain color of the flower that's, that's a little bit different or the stature of it or the form. Um, and then that, that characteristic is can be maintained by propagation. So sometimes a cultivar is just um, a naturally occurring mutation that's been selected for from a, a wild population. Um, more often it's a deliberate crossbreeding or a deliberate hybridization of a couple of plants. Okay, that's helpful. And um, just to add to that, for folks that are visiting the garden center and wondering, oh my gosh, am I looking at a cultivar or an actual straight species of a native plant, um, looking at those single quotations for the names, and I frequently use echinacea as an example, like echinacea purpurea would be straight species, echinacea purpurea, single quotes, uh, single quote magnus, single quote would be a cultivar, right? Right, that's okay. correct. All right, mm -hmm. super. Thank you. And um, genetic diversity is a hot topic now, so could you talk a little bit about um, it, that importance uh, in, our, in our ecosystem and why this is a topic that's um, important to you? Right, so when you're looking at a, a true species or a wild population of a native plant, there's going to be an enormous amount of genetic variation within that population that's probably going to make it a little more um, resilient in terms of um, how it responds to different disturbances within the environment. And that, that genetic variation can be important for surviving um, periods of drought or periods of water inundation, um, just makes, th makes that plant population much more re resilient. And with a cultivar, you're oftentimes extremely limiting um, that genetic population, sometimes down to a single plant, if, if that entire cultivar was perhaps derived from one plant, which then the seeds were collected from that one plant, perhaps, and propagated on. 
And you you had mentioned to me uh, when we spoke earlier that uh, your planting for the straight species plant is only local genotypes. Talk a little bit about that, if you would. Right, that's correct. So there's been growing evidence that it's really important to not just select a native plant, which could be as broad as native to the to North America or native to the United States, but it's really important to also select a, a native plant that is um, that originally came and has sort of evolved over the years in your um, in what we call an ecotype, your local ecotype, where um, so for us here in Vermont, it can be as specific as perhaps a native plant coming from the New England area or even more specifically to Vermont or even where I'm at in the, the Champlain Valley. Um, and so there can be some different variations in bloom time with that genetic diversity um, when that when that plant sort of um, emerges in the spring or goes back dormant in the fall. So it's important to, to take that plant from as close to your location as you can um, obtain a plant. And of course, that's a bit of a frustrating task for a lot of uh, home gardeners just trying to right. find mm -hmm. these local genotypes. So I suggest to folks um, ask the question of local nurseries and uh, start them thinking about it. So hopefully that'll help us find the, the local genotypes that we're looking for. Um, do you have uh, sources, a lot of sources in Vermont um, for locally grown plants? No, it's been a, actually a huge challenge with this project. Uh, we do not have a, a great source here locally, and I found that a lot of the nurseries that do carry true species of natives, they're, all, they're often sourcing those from Pennsylvania or Massachusetts. Um, so there's a big need right here um, locally in northern New England, I would say, for nurseries that are propagating um, local species from our area. Uh, in so New York it, as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we all need to kind of ask that question of our growers. Right, yes. And having previously um, worked in the Midwest, uh, fortunately there's, there's often, um, I think there's more established nurseries there who have been propagating uh, species of native plants for much longer. So it was easier working in, in northern Indiana and Wisconsin and Illinois, um, but much more challenging here in northern New England. Um, well, thank you for that. Now, would you uh, just share with us a little bit about the nature of your research, um, the particular aspects of it that you think are most important, um, including the number of plant species you're looking at, et cetera? Sure. Well, what, I, what I'm really trying to answer very broadly is if we are as humans, um, kind of unintentionally breeding the ecological benefits out of native plants. And so more specifically, I'm looking at if cultivars of native plants are the ecological equivalent of the true open pollinated or species um, native plants in terms of attracting and sustaining populations of native pollinators. So I chose to look at specifically pollinators because um, Restoring healthy pollinator populations right now is such a big topic, and um, it was sort of one area that I also had some observations working with native plants that seemed like um, potentially there were some differences between the the cultivars and the natives. So I chose to specifically focus in on pollinators, um, and most specifically native pollinators, although I'm looking at... Um, honeybees as well, and also some, oh, some bugs and beetles, and I'm collecting data on everything. So I, I have two um, large research plots set up in two different locations here in northern Vermont, and uh, they're large replicated sites so that I can statistically analyze the data and get some, some strong results one way or another. And I have about 500 um, plants total, and I have 14 different pairings of of species. So I'm looking at 14 species and within each of those species I have the true um, open pollinated or true species and then I paired that with uh, a cultivar and I, I chose um, usually um, a cultivar that was more uh, commonly found in the landscape industry, at least here in Vermont, um, more commonly used. And in some cases, um, sometimes they're is only one cultivar of that species yes. that's on the market. And uh, sometimes, you know, availability did unfortunately have to play a big factor into what species I could choose to, to work with here and including the cultivar of what 
what I could get a large number of plants um, of and in my area. Mm -hmm. um, could you give us some examples of, of some of these pairings that you've planted? Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, one species, um, butterfly weed would be an example, Asclepias tuberosa, and the cultivar of that, which we're um, mostly seeing on the market, is Hello Yellow. Mm -hmm. um, so there's one. Uh, oh, I've, I'm looking at a few different Echinaceas. Um, Echinacea purpurea is our, our true native purple comb flower, and I'm looking at three different cultivars, white swan, which is a white version of that, um, sunrise big sky, which is a, a new um, hybrid that's um, just recently surfaced, and then pink double delight, which is um, a double flower mm -hmm. and also in a pink color. So that's an interesting point to um, uh, launch from because I um, I advise folks to try to avoid double flowered plants if they're trying to attract pollinators. What what was your result so far in looking at that those um, echinacea, the one straight species and the three cultivars? Right. This has actually been um, very interesting. It was the only species where I did uh, multiple comparisons within the same species. Um, so I found that the um, there was no significant difference between the true species and white swan, um, which is just a, a white flower. I found that the white swan was just as attractive. Um, however, I found significant differences between the, the sunrise, which is a hybrid again, and the hybrid pink double delight. So, there were um, significantly fewer native pollinators visiting um, the sunrise and the pink double delight than were visiting the, the straight species. And um, are you able to tell, um, I don't know how much data you're keeping on specific pollinators, are you able to tell what species may be more attractive to some pollinators than others? Right, so I'm, I'm collecting as much data as I possibly can on that. Um, I am collecting this data visually, so I am, um, I'm going into the field at set times of the day for set durations, and I am um, sitting there and watching these plants. <laughs> uh, so there, there's a number of pollinators that I can identify from um, a few feet away, um, such as honeybees and some mm -hmm. different species of bumblebees and green sweat bees and orchard bees. Um, and then there's also a large number of pollinators that, that you just, you can't visually distinguish the species. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes you need a scope. Uh, you need to capture the, the pollinator in the scope. So I've, I've created 11 different categories, 11 different groups, which I use um, to collect my data in the field. So examples, you know, one group is honeybees, another group is all species of bumblebees together, um, another group is, is small dark bees, and in that group I would include um, things like dark sweat bees and small carpenter bees and yellow face bees, um, small adrenid bees. So I've, I've taken quite a while to sort of mm -hmm. work out this, this system, and this is what I feel comfortable with. Um, and I've done some, some testing of my um, ability to identify these um, accurately in the field. So you mentioned you're focusing on bees, but your 11 categories, do you include in those 11 categories um, butterflies, skippers, and moths? Yes, yeah, so I have seven categories of bees, or they are all in the, the family Hymenoptera. Um, and then I also have a group for all moths and butterflies, which are Lepidoptera, um, a group for all beetles, a group for all flies, and a group for all bugs, mm -hmm. um, Hemipteras. And since um, many of our moths are actually um, seeking nectar at night, how do you how do you account for that? That must be a little challenging. Right. So far, I have not accounted for that. <laughs> um, okay, we'll but let, I, you, let you go on that one. <laughs> right. But I may next summer. I do think it would be interesting, um, even to get out just a couple nights. Okay. Um, I probably won't collect enough data to really make it statistically publishable, but. Mm -hmm. um, but it'd be fun to see what's going on at night. And you had mentioned um, to me in another conversation that there are about 275 species of native bees in Vermont, correct? Right, that's okay. correct. So you've got a lot to account for. Right, yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> and um, 
Of the other plants that you've um, been researching, any other particular standouts where you were surprised by the results? Um, yes, a, f a few things that jumped out at me. Um, one thing that really surprised me, I have a common yarrow in the in the research, which is um, really just a, a roadside weed around here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know of anyone who's actually planted <laughs> the true species in their garden. Um, and I, I couldn't find this in a nursery. I had This was one plant I did have to go out and collect myself um, from a population that I, I felt quite certain was a, a native population here. Um, and I had previously observed that, that this plant attracts a lot of, of just our really small dark bees that often get kind of overlooked. They're not bumblebees, they're not these flashy colors, but um, we just have a large number of species of really small um, dark bees. <laughs> and so I paired that with a the cultivar Strawberry Seduction, which is a red mm -hmm. version of this um, this plant, and there was just a, a hugely significant difference between the two. And and I think a couple different things could be going on here. Um, probably the most obvious is that uh, strawberry seduction, as you might guess, it's a red color. And and bees see in a different mm -hmm. color spectrum than we mm -hmm. see. Um, we see invisible light and they see an ultraviolet light. And mm -hmm. red is very difficult for them to detect and see. And so... Um, so that may be um, a huge factor in how attractive that plant was. Were there other pollinators going to that plant at all? Uh, no, very few. Um, occasionally butterflies, and butterflies are um, attracted to the that deep red color. Mm -hmm. um, Probably hard still, to know if they were getting much out of the plant, though. Right? right, right. And so that will be the second part of my study, which I'll be delving into this summer, is not only to take data on how attractive the plant is, so not just data on number of visits, but I'm also going to be extracting nectar and pollen from the plant to see how much of a benefit that pollinator is getting. So it may be that... Um, the cultivar was attracting the occasional butterfly or two, and the butterfly was going and landing on the plant, but perhaps they were getting no mm -hmm. nectar. And so by doing um, that additional step in this study, I'll be able to tease out uh, the actual benefit that the plant is providing back to the pollinator. And that's fantastic, because I think there's very little research in that area, and that's right. um, something that I'm always thinking about is what is the actual value of the nectar or the pollen, um, even if a pollinator does go to the plant. So kudos mm -hmm. to you. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, how about some, some other examples? Now, you mentioned Asclepius tuberosa. How about um, the results on that one in particular? Right. So in that plant, I have not thus far seen any difference between uh, the straight species and the cultivar. Um, and I believe that the this particular cultivar, Hello Yellow, is just a, a selection that was probably a naturally occurring um, mutation in a population, and it tends to be, um, it has a, a more yellow hue, as you might guess, um, than the the straight species, which is a little deeper orange. Um, so I I didn't have a significant result, but, but I did find that actually more pollinators were attracted to that one. It wasn't significant enough to really call it, but um, okay. perhaps with more data, I might be able to see that that it, in some circumstances, um, you could perhaps select for a, um, a more attractive version of the plant. Well, I know a lot of people have, the, have trouble with the orange um, flower color of uh, the straight species, mm -hmm. um, but if we're trying to plant ecologically, obviously this is very good information that it may attract, you know, some somewhat uh, more in the way of, of pollinators. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at your list of plants, and I also see one of my all-time favorites, uh, Agastache funiculum, Anis hyssop, and you've compared that to um, a cultivar golden jubilee, is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And um, how did that go? And with that one, I saw no significant difference between the two. And um, in terms of the form of the plant and the flower of the plant, they're very, very similar. They're similar stature, similar height. They appear to have very similar um, number of flowers per plant. They both have the same lavender um, 
spiked flowers. And so the big difference between the two is the leaf color. That Golden Jubilee has mm -hmm. um, sort of these fun chartreuse colored, uh, really bright leaves on them. Um, so I think what I'm finding is that the, the that the closer the cultivar is to the straight species in terms of flower, um, the hue of the flower, the color of the flower, and the form of the plant, that the, the closer it is um, in terms of those characteristics, the more likely it is to attract the same number of, of pollinators. That's it's incredibly helpful information. Um, and another thing that occurs to me, because that's a plant that I also use for um, seeds for birds, I always mm -hmm. wonder what the seed set might be on a, on a straight species versus a cultivar. Right, and I think there's tremendous variation between, um, well, with among cultivars. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, you may have exactly the same seed set. Um, in other cases, and particularly when they're hybrids, you may have no seed set. Uh, it could be a, um, a sterile hybrid, right. Um, right. which could not propagate um, whatsoever. But I th that is a, an excellent question. I'm not going to look at um, mm -hmm. seed set in this research project, but I... Something um, to think about. Something I, yeah, love that, to look at in the future. That's year five. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, now, there's some other interesting ones that you have here. Uh, Lobelia cardinalis um, compared to Lobelia cardinalis fried green tomatoes. Talk a little bit about that one. Uh-huh. Um, that is uh, one parent that I, again, in the first season, did not see a significant difference between the two. Um I did have, I really struggled with um, maintaining this species over the winter. I had a lot of die off, so mm -hmm. that's also something I'll, I can look at. Um, I really struggled with the fried green tomatoes. It may just um, not quite be hardy enough for northern Vermont, so I had to replant a large number of those, um, those plants. But once they were established, the plants that I did have, uh, they both seemed to be um, equally attractive. And again, the fried green tomatoes, the biggest difference I see, they're both red, red flowers. Mm -hmm. um, biggest difference I see is, is in the, the leaves. It has a much um, deeper, almost purple, um, leaf color. Mm -hmm. And, and so this is not a great pollinator plant in terms of native bees, but it does get, um, hummingbirds, of course, um, Right. Love this plant and uh, butterflies as well. Mm -hmm. Now, in uh, this coming summer, um, you're going to be doing more research. Will you be doing um, a similar analysis or expanding your analysis? I'll be expanding the analysis. Um, I'm hoping to be able to collect about twice as much data. I'm going to have um, a couple of interns working with me that will um, make this process a little bit easier for myself. Um, and I will be, I'll be collecting all the same data I did last summer, which includes the pollinator visits. Um, I also um, measure the plant height and the number of flowers per plant and take a lot of um, climate data, just what the what the cloud cover is that day, the temperature, the humidity. Um, and and next summer, the big thing that I will add is the analysis of uh, the, the nectar, the nectar volume and the nectar sugar content, mm -hmm. and also the, the pollen mass. Now, I'm sorry, that's this summer or next summer that you'll be doing that? This coming summer, this coming summer, summer 2014. 2014. Got it. Yes. And uh, you'll be publishing the, the, uh, the results, I assume? Yes, that is my plan. I hope to analyze all the data that I have um, at the end of the field season in 2014 and um, hope to have some publishable um, written papers in early 2015. Fantastic. And in the interim, there's a lot of great information on your website. Um, I really encourage uh, listeners to take a look at that as well. So um, let's talk about some more of these flowers. Um, any other standouts that you'd like to talk about? Uh, sure. I'm glancing through my list right now. Um, New England aster is is one standout. I looked at the straight species of New England aster um, and compared to that to, oh, I, I don't ever attempt to pronounce the name, but um, <laughs> <laughs> Alma... Pochki, maybe? Pochki, perhaps. Sounds I really good. ought to learn how to pronounce that. Um, <laughs> For listeners, it's P-O-E-T-S-C-H-K-E. -E, Alma Pochki. Pachki. <laughs> <laughs> and how did Alma fare? <laughs> so Alma did not fare very well. Oh dear. Um, it, it 
certainly attracted pollinators and um, as most of us know, the New England asters, they bloom very late in the season, mm -hmm. so they're a really important pollinator plant. Very important for our monarch butterflies, because they're one of the few flowers that are blooming that late in the season, and they do provide a lot of, a lot of um, energy in the form of nectar. And so I found that um, comparing the two in the same garden, that the majority of the pollinators were going to the straight species and not going to the cultivar, which um, is not as bright purple. It has a, a mm -hmm. deeper pink color. Um, but what's interesting is I've actually seen this cultivar planted out in some landscapes where the the straight species is not available, and I've seen lots of pollinators on it. Okay. So, so in some problem. cases, it could be, well, if there's nothing else, yes. then the pollinators will go to it. But if given the option between the, the, the true native and this cultivar, they would choose the true native. And there seem to be more and more cultivars of our native asters that are available right. in all sorts of mm -hmm. weird colors, so mm -hmm. word to the wise. Mm -hmm. um, some other plants that you looked at, um, one of my favorites, and there are not many cultivars available of this, um, Monarda fistulosa. Mm -hmm. Talk about that one. Right. I uh, did not see a difference in this pairing, and I myself actually had a hard time telling the difference between the two. And uh, that was one of the few <laughs> that's plants Claire, where I... Claire Grace, right? Claire the, Grace, Claire, yes. Monarda fistulosa, Claire Grace, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. continue, sorry. Right, and so it um, that was noteworthy because I, I normally could, I, I didn't have to look at my plant tags. I always knew what I was looking at, but um, really they had the very similar form, similar height, similar number of flowers per plant. Um, and so the, the Claire Grace is a little bit more mildew resistant. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't see a difference between the two. And I think, um, again, this is a cultivar that is just very, very similar to the the straight species. Okay. So, Okay, so that, that we'll keep mm -hmm. on the list. And you looked at uh, Baptisia australis and Baptisia twilight prairie blues. Talk about those. Right. I did not get enough data to make a conclusion in that pairing and really the reason is baptisia is very slow to establish mm -hmm. um so i really need it needed an extra growing season to get it established and blooming mm -hmm. i would just very very flu bl blooms per plant um some of the plants didn't bloom at all last summer okay. so i'm just holding off on that Got one, it. Um, and that actually data. brings up um a, a thought about um bees their shape their species their size and access to different um flowers because as we both know, different bees go to different flowers, and that's Baptisia's one in the legume family, which has kind of funny-looking flowers that not all bees can go to. So, mm -hmm. are you um, are you accounting for that species interrelation in any way between the plant and the insect? Yeah, so um, because I'm taking data on the different pollinator groups, and they tend to be grouped um, according to size and some of their their tendencies, um, I will be able to to dive further into my analysis. So, so um, the conclusions that I'm giving you today, I've grouped all native pollinators together, um, but I will do further analysis to be able to show whether it's um, Let's say a bumblebee is is just as attractive to the cultivar, but maybe honeybees are less attractive. Um, so the you brought up the example of uh, Baptisia um, that have sort of flowers that are a little bit more difficult to open. Mm -hmm. um, so th they would probably be more visited by bumblebees, which tend to be very very strong, and they have the uh, ability to really get inside get inside of flowers. Mm -hmm. Or some of the bee species might nectar rob too, which would be an interesting mm -hmm. thing to take a look at. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, other plants that I see on your list, um, Penstemon digitalis versus a very commonly used uh, cultivar Husker Red. How did mm -hmm. that do? Yeah, I didn't see a difference between those two. Um, again, that's an example where the, the flowers of the plant and the plant form seem to be very similar, but the, the leaves and the stems are what what gives it the name Husker Red uh, has a, a deeper red, sort of purple hue to that. Um, so there I did not see a difference. Okay. And again, this is just a difference in how attractive it is. So it right. will be very interesting next summer to see if maybe they're just as attractive, but they're not providing as much nectar mm -hmm. or not as much um, mm -hmm. 
pollen. Over time, <laughs> absolutely. And uh, Helenium autumnale, and a cultivar we don't see here, Marime oh. Beauty. Um, mm -hmm. I've never actually seen that available for sale here in New York. Um, how did that one do? Uh, there was a huge difference between this one. Um, I would say one of the more significant differences. And the the Hellenium autumnale, the straight species, is this uh, just really abundantly flowering, um, yellow flowers, very tall, blooms late in the season. And the this particular cultivar, I was really surprised. It looks like a totally different species. Okay. Um, it's very, very short, um, didn't have very many flowers per plant, and it has a um, uh, more of a, an orange and red kind of bicolored flower. Mm -hmm. um, so that was just a, a enormous difference between the two plants. Even when you account for the number of flowers per plant, um, still the the straight species um, was significantly much more attractive. Mm -hmm. And that makes me wonder about um, some of these dwarf cultivars. Um, I'm just thinking of, um, what is it, um, Helianthus salicifolius, the lowdown. Have you, do you see that one up in Vermont? It's a little tiny dwarf Helianthus and uh, looks completely different. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so I, that, that begs that question too. That'd be interesting. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting. And the, um, looking at the number of flowers per plant, I think is is yes. valuable um, when choosing plants for a garden, uh, for a pollinator garden. Uh, it may just be that it's producing just as much nectar and pollen and it's just as attractive, but you're only providing, uh, let's say, 50 flowers right. versus 200 flowers. Maybe a hard target for the pollinator to mm -hmm. find. Right. So in your, in your um, planting fields, um, do you have things grouped in large quantities? To explain how that works. I have them grouped in sets of six plants. And I did that because a lot of bees um, tend to be attracted to a larger mass mm -hmm. and they have a hard time um, detecting single plants. And, um, and this is sort of anecdotal evidence. I haven't seen this backed up by any particular scientific study, but uh, the general recommendation is in the, the landscaping world is if you want to attract pollinators, you want to plant in, in small masses, at least four or five plants grouped together. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of bees practice um, what we call floral constancy, mm -hmm. where they'll feed on a, a single species um, in a foraging trip away from their nest. Mm -hmm. So you're making it a little bit easier for them to find those resources by planting them together. And probably having even more plants if you're using small ones. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're using these really large ones. Um, one of my favorite plants I don't see here, um, Joe Pieweed. Um, any reason that that was excluded? Uh, yes, unfortunately I had to exclude it because my grower who was growing the true species for me, mm -hmm. Um, a local supplier here in Vermont. Um, oh, they had something happen with their greenhouse and all the plants Got were it. lost. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, you know, occasionally these little stories sort of tied in and had to eliminate okay. certain plants. So, you. Um, Well, um, that's okay. It, we've seen a lot of uh, use of these smaller cultivars. Um, right. Mm -hmm. Baby Joe and Little Joe, which seem to me to be the same plant, but um, and I've always wondered how beneficial they are versus, you know, some of the straight species, um, Joe Pies. Mm -hmm. um, and um, another plant that you studied, uh, Rudbeckia fulgida and Rudbeckia fulgida uh, goldstrom. Mm -hmm. how, did, how did that work out? I saw a big difference between the two, which um, that one I was a really surprised with because I felt like they do have a, a certainly similar color. They're both that yellow gold color, um, fairly similar forms. The the gold sturm is a little bit more uh, compact, uh, whereas the straight species is a little more whimsical. Um, so that one really surprised me. I didn't think there'd be a big difference between the two, and there did. So this will be very interesting to look at the, the nectar and pollen production next summer. And uh, going through your list, because I know readers want to know about all these plants, um, Tradescantia ohioensis versus uh, red grape. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did see a difference between these two. Um, and this may be attributed to the color again. The red grape is um, uh, much pinker, kind of a darker mm -hmm. pink, whereas the, the straight species is a real vibrant violet mm -hmm. color. 
Um, also, the red grape did not bloom as early. It bloomed much oh, later. That's interesting. Um, and so the, um, the straight species blooms quite early early when there's not a lot else available and it seems to be a very very attractive plant early on in the season and so so another thing that may be going on here is with that cultivar blooming later when a lot of other flowers were blooming it may not have been the uh, the most preferred blooming flower mm -hmm, in the garden mm -hmm. and, and that you've bringing up a, a good point about uh, succession succession of bloom in the garden how important that is to really mm -hmm. have um, things available from um, as early as you can in spring through late fall uh, it seems like you've covered the bases on that in your garden mm -hmm. yep. yes i've i've intentionally um chose my species to try to have some early blooming flowers and some late blooming flowers um, have a variety of colors and have some cultivars that are just selections and some cultivars mm -hmm. that are um, a little bit more manipulated by humans and mm -hmm. some hybrids mm -hmm. now one of the early bloomers on your list is um aquilegia canadensis and then mm -hmm. the uh, cultivar corbett mm -hmm. what were the results I, that was another pairing that I could not get enough data on um, last spring. We had a very um, interesting kind of wet and cold winter, and um, I lost quite a few flowers, so I needed to do some okay. replanting. So that's one I'll have to hold off and okay. I'll look at this and summer. Last one on the list um, from what I'm looking at is uh, the Verona Castrum virginicum versus Lavender mm -hmm. Towers. Mm -hmm. That's a plant I really like to use, the uh, straight species. How did Lavender Towers do? Uh, lavender Towers did very well. It did just as well as the straight species. Um, and that was another plant that I had a hard time telling the difference between the two. I didn't mm -hmm. see any real visual uh, distinction between the Lavender Towers and the, the straight species. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure what the, the characteristic that was selected for there was. Um, Veronicastrum is a little slow to establish. Mm -hmm. So the, the plants were a little bit on the petite side in 2013. So it'll be interesting to see how that plant does does develop uh, this summer but that seems to be just an amazing um, plant for pollinators it's Absolutely. just covered with with bumblebees and butterflies and honeybees and um, just about any kind of bee seems to be attracted to the veronicastrum now some of these plants like it moist like that particular plant some of them you know for example like the asclepias tuberosa like it kind of dry and infertile so do you, mm -hmm. have you cited these things accordingly um, no, I have grouped them all together. So they're wow. all um, tolerant of full sun conditions, um, which is what I have on both my sites. I have uh, fairly sandy soils on both sides, so mm -hmm. I do have irrigation. Um, and I, I just decided not to cater to the individual needs of each plant. So Good for um, you. <laughs> I yeah, <laughs> I had to simplify it somehow. Uh, and most gardeners, you know, once they plant, that's kind of it. Um, right. They don't want to have to fuss. But um, I think probably in your own home garden, do pay attention to right plant in the right place. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, for better success. Mm -hmm. So th these are really fascinating uh, results that you have, and I think you're you're doing some really groundbreaking research here. Um, any any points that you'd like to bring up in summary that you think um, landscape pros and home gardeners should take away as points for their own landscapes they're working on? Mm -hmm. Well, I think my my general rule is if, if a true native plant is going to fulfill all of the characteristics that you're looking for for a plant in your landscape, I would always consider um, a native plant first. And um, in addition to considering the native plant, consider the true species first. Um, as a, a landscape designer, I certainly think that there are um, numerous times where a cultivar is um, a choice that you might want to use due mm -hmm. to a color in the garden or the, the shorter stature of a cultivar. Um, but I think that you should just be aware that there may be some ecological trade-offs and if given um, the choice of multiple cultivars trying to pick a cultivar that's as close to the the straight species as you can um, is is going to provide the most benefit 
Well, I think that's terrific advice, and uh, and you're reinforcing what I've been saying for a while, so I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, well, I encourage uh, listeners to take a look at www.pollinatorgardens.org and to follow this fascinating research that uh, that you're doing. So, Annie White, thank you so much for your time and your hard work, and uh, we're all going to be following your information um, very anxiously. Thanks so much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This is Kim Ironman from Eco Beneficial. Thanks for watching. For more useful gardening tips to improve our environment, please visit us at www.ecobeneficial.com.